Hello. Today I'm wearing my Aliens t-shirt because I'm going to be talking about science fiction. Um, I should just tell you that I'm a total fan of the Ellen Ripley Alien movies to the extent that we named our second daughter Judith after her. So she's du Judith Ellen, not Eleanor Ellen. Um, I, my most, li my most recent book is actually a book of short science fiction stories with a philosophical twist. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to read the preface which explains how this came into existence and I'm going to read the first story which is called A Better Ray Gun. There's not a lot to say about this, I mean you'll, you'll get the, the gist of it, but um, my main interest, I, I say, my main interest in science fiction is aliens. Alien psychology, the differences between humans and aliens, looking at, a, looking at human beings from an alien perspective and so on. Um, that's the sort of stuff that really moves me and has a lot of philosophical ideas bound up in that as well. So, um, yeah, the other thing is this, uh, you know, why am I making a video today? I looked up on the internet to see how often should you make a vid YouTube video so it get lots of people watching and what day should you post it? And it said, well, you should make a video once a week and you should post it on a Thursday. I have no idea why I have to post a, a video on a Thursday, but I'm doing it because I want as many people as possible to see the video. Um, and the other thing is this. I had the idea of making a new video for each one of the books that I've published on Amazon, going backwards in time. So my last video, um, uh, The Ultimate Question, was about this book. I might not have existed, but someone exactly like me might have existed in my place. And that was the last philosophy book. But the very, very last book that I published was this. Better Ray Gun um, and Other Tales. And as you do, I found the picture of a ray gun on the internet searching for ray gun. And I did put an acknowledgement at the beginning of the book. It was a Creative Commons license. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so without more ado, let me read the preface and then I'll read the, the first chapter. This is for all the foreign heroes of the sci-fi genre. One of my favourite leisure activities is losing myself in a great sci-fi movie. You'd probably guess that from my sci-fi stories collected together in this book. When I am writing, it is images rather than words that come to my mind. Before I studied philosophy, I was an avid fan of science fiction novels and short stories, especially authors who explored deep philosophical ideas like Philip K. Dick. The 20 sci-fi stories collected in this book were written at two different times. I wrote 10 over 1990 to 91 for philosophy classes run by the Workers' Educational Association, Sheffield. I later used these for first year tutorial sessions at Sheffield University. In 1995, my sci-fi stories became the backbone of the first of my six Pathways to Philosophy, A Possible World Machine. Over the years, they have been read and commented on by numerous students from every angle and have stood the test of time. One of the stories, The Black Box, was selected for the fifth edition of Doing Philosophy, an Introduction Through Thought Experiments, edited by Theodore Schick and Lewis Vaughan, published by McGraw-Hill. This prompted me to have another try, and in 2012, I wrote another 10 sci-fi stories. All were around 800 words more sketches than complete stories and in need of further development, but I kept putting this off until now. 
If you've read The Possible Role Machine or studied the units in the introductory pathway, then you will know roughly when each of the stories was written. If not, well, you can guess. I hope you enjoy reading these as much as I enjoyed writing them. Okay. So I've decided <coughs> to read the first story, which is the, the title story, A Better Ray Gun. There's an old saying which dates back to the time when there existed a species of earth mammal known as mice, or mouse in the singular. Funny name, isn't it? Well, imagine your average juxtacockle from Taurus Prime, then reduce it by a factor of ten. That's a mouse. Although they were sometimes kept as pets, mice were generally regarded as a pest, much as sentient tomatoes are now, but much faster and more difficult to catch. The saying was, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. The story goes, or it could be urgent legend, that the inventor of mouse flu took this motto to heart and created a biological weapon so accurately targeted that only mice were susceptible, and it wiped them all out. Unfortunately, the inventor didn't make much profit from his invention, not even enough to cover his expenses, because once the mice were gone, well, you've guessed it, a warning to all you would-be inventors out there. <coughs> invention is one of the key drivers in a market economy. To make a success of your invention, you don't have to come up with anything wildly original just an item that does his job a little better than the previous version. A mouse trap that's more efficient at catching mice, for example. But as we've seen, you don't want to want it to be too good either. I built a better ray gun. You didn't hear about it, did you? You wouldn't have. The citizens of our shiny new world don't want to know how we got here. These days, the study of history is discouraged. The general consensus is there's nothing useful to learn from the past. We're much better now, supposedly. I'd better warn you, though, as far as I'm concerned, this is not a happy story. Heartbreaking, in fact. The story starts, oh, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. That was a time when wave after wave of alien invaders were making a hideous nuisance of themselves, quite literally. They were ugly, loathsome and altogether aggravating. In point of fact, I've never seen a beautiful alien. Earth had become a popular place to park your spaceship for a few weeks before moving on to create havoc somewhere else. There was no longer any Earth government to speak of. That was an early casualty of the alien invasions. So human beings had to help one another out as best they could. The aliens came from every planet in the galaxy, or so it seemed. As a result, there was something of an arms race going on between different ray gun makers, speeded up by the fact that each time a new species of alien appeared, more often than not, the old ray guns didn't work, and you had to come up with something new. Now, you're probably thinking, what's the difficulty? As everybody knows, ray guns can be very powerful and extremely efficient at causing death and destruction. But that's exactly the problem. When you're shooting aliens, you don't want to disintegrate your house, or your swimming pool, or whatever your gun happens to be pointing at, do you? Especially, as I said, this was happening practically all the time. Precise targeting, that's the holy grail of any ray gun design. Point and shoot. Ideally, just one lethal shot should be enough. Of course, the warlords and the military class had a stake in this too. Although they were generally gung-ho about blasting houses, cities, or even planets on occasion, which incidentally is how we ended up with all the jacksticockles. You know the sad story as well as I do. Believe me, you don't want to get involved with them, however bad a fix you're in. Being a bit of inventor, being a bit of an inventor, I thought I'd have a go at designing a ray gun myself. I'd had some success in the past. My sentient tomato paralyzer was considered by many who were knowledgeable about weapons design to be a piece, a fine piece of engineering. So this is the point where we meet Darak, who is actually the most important person in this story. One thing you need to know about Darak is that he likes philosophy. 
Once you know his quirks, though, he's not that difficult to get along with. Derek and I shared a workshop, which we rented from a local warlord. It was actually an abandoned police station, back from the time when they still had police. Those were days. The building itself was in a terrible state of repair, having been raided on numerous occasions. But the underground cells were useful for holding various species of captured alien, so that we could test our guns on them. Now you'll probably say this is cruel, but I look at it this way. A quick kill is much better than a lingering, agonising death. The aliens who gave their lives for ray gun development made the deaths of the aliens who came after less unpleasant than they would otherwise have been. Derek made an additional point that the aliens that we captured got to live an extra two or three weeks longer than the aliens who were blasted off as soon as they touched down in their space wagons. Getting to live longer is a good thing, isn't it? As I said, Derek was a bit of a philosopher, and that's a pretty strong argument in my book. We gathered up the survivors, fed them, nursed them back to health, and generally tried to make their last days in the universe as pleasant as possible. They even had TVs in their cells with all the channels. One way or another they were going to die, but that was not nece wasn't necessarily any reason to treat them with less respect. And that takes us more or less to the crux of the story. Derek and I were trying out the latest prototype. The idea was to disrupt neurotransmitters and instantly wipe out all brain functions. Target neutralised. But it was a complete dud. The aliens we used it on seemed to become very agitated, but that was about all. The howling, grunting and screeching was getting on my nerves. I'd never heard anything like it, not even in the middle of a battlefield. Let's get some fresh air, Derek said. We were fooling around in the backyard, taking turns to aim the prototype at various objects. The gun made a funny sound as you shot it, like someone spitting out a piece of chewing gum. Then somehow, I don't exactly know how it happened, I accidentally shot Derek. You stupid idiot! Derek got as far as saying. Then a beatific smile spread on his face. You're wonderful. I love you. Two hours later, Derek was still pounding on the door of the nuclear waste storeroom. Where I had barricaded myself in for my own protection. Listen to yourself, Derek, damn it. I like to think that Derek, even at the height of his frenzy, still had a part of him that was detached and rational and able to comprehend what was happening to him. Eventually, Derek did calm down and then started the lecture. Moral Philosophy 101 Look what we've achieved! This could be the end of all war and conflict and the beginning of a new age of universal love, blah blah blah. There are models of our invention still around from the first hurriedly manufactured batch of 50, worth a fortune on the black market. Well I can think of a full s some cool uses which have nothing to do with war and conflict, hey hey. Naturally, the warlords were not too happy. They cottoned on pretty quickly to what was going on and had military kitted out in full protection gear, their sensitive brains safely encased in signal-jamming silicon helmets. <laughs> but Derek had one trick up his sleeve. A love gun. I'm just going to call it that, even though I hate the word. Only needs to work on one person, human or alien. It doesn't matter. Give, a, give each of those people a love gun, and they each find someone to shoot. You can't keep your protective helmet on all the time. I mean, you have to have a shower occasionally. The logic. Hell, this was the genius bit. It's the logic of seduction, not the logic of warfare. In warfare, you have to kill and keep on killing. In seduction, you only need to find one person to seduce, then wait around for the chain reaction. The outcome was inevitable. Today, universal peace reigns. We still have aliens, far too many, who find Earth an ideal holiday resort. Business is booming, and the only deaths are from natural causes or the occasional accident with a nuclear-powered barbecue. Politically, nothing much has changed. Who needs a government when people don't need to be compelled to be nice to one another? 
According to the Interplanetary Peace Treaty, all weapons had to be destroyed. There was a heated debate over the love gun, but in the end the delegates decided it was a weapon, because even though you're doing the victim a favour and not causing any harm at all, the person you shoot isn't given the choice. I wish I had a time machine. <laughs> um, yeah, so what happened? I, I thought of that. It just came to me on the bus, you know, the idea of a better ray gun. Um, listen, why am I doing this? I would love you to actually go out and buy this book. I mean, you won't see it in the shops because it's on Amazon. I'll show it to you again. I know the internet is full of people trying to sell stuff and I've, up to now, I've kind of avoided doing all that. But um, the main thing is it would encourage me to do more. I just don't feel very motivated because too few people are buying the book. Too few people are view viewing it, reading it. I would like you to buy it. I would like you to take a photograph of it with your iPhone or Android and post it on Facebook. Read it, of course. Review it on Amazon. Review it on Goodreads. Tell your friends about it. You know, why not? Um, what's in it for you? Well, you'd be cool. You'd be able to say, I discovered Jeffrey Klempner before he was taken up by a major publisher, you know, before he became famous or whatever. Um, it's a cool thing to do. And they are actually, there's 20 really cracking stories in that book. Um, it will give you a few hours of very pleasant um, entertainment, I would say, and some philosophical ideas to think about too. So um, that's all I'm going to say for today. And guess what? The next video is going to be about the previous book, which is um, uh, Philosophizer's Bible. So I'm going to do something about that, and then something about Philosophizer, and I'm just going to work our way back through all my books. So you know what to expect. Um, as I said, buy the book, tell your friends, and support this channel. Thanks very much. Bye.